six o'clock. So thank you to everyone who has um, joined. And I know we are getting a lot more people signing on at the moment. Uh, we're doing this as a webinar as opposed to our usual um, open Zoom talk. Uh, the webinar just gives us a better platform to have our panelists. Um, and we will be, um, we are very excited to be sharing uh, Stillness in Motion, Art Meets Dance, um, which Jackie, I think, will give us a nice introduction to. Um, I think there's still quite a few people that we're waiting for. Um, but Jackie, would you like to just introduce everybody that's part of the panel? Thanks very much, Arisha, and uh, good evening to everyone who's joining us. It's, um, we're delighted to have a large audience who've been interested in, in coming to this collaboration that we've got with Johannesburg Ballet. So welcome to everyone, and we'd really like to, to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days to join us for this event. We're going to be talking to, from Joburg Ballet, we have Ian MacDonald and Keke Chele, and then later on, Wilhelm is going to talk to the two curators, Tumelo Lecane and Mario Gaglione. And Arisha is going to be talking about that very interesting artwork that you see behind her, uh, the Norman Catherine Hu Zoo. And, and uh, Richard Spix in Demande from Strauss is also is going to talk about the Mongazis. So um, I'm not sure if everyone's managed to get on yet or if, if, we, if we should start, Arisha. Arisha? Yeah. Um, so you are muted and also Dumi says he is online but he can't get onto his video. Okay, so I see we are at six o'clock. Um, I think if people are running a bit late, they can just join in as we start. Um, but yeah, I think we will start. So welcome to all our panelists and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm, we wish we could have had this as a live event in our, at our offices and for you to witness the, the dancing firsthand, but um, obviously we can't. And uh, luckily we do have this virtual platform that does allow us to still have these amazing collaborations um, and have these events on a different platform. Um, so from here, I think I'm gonna hand over to Jackie and then we'll start all the proceedings from there. Well, thanks very much, Arisha. And again, delighted to, uh, to welcome everybody who is slowly joining on to this webinar. As Arisha said, new for us, we're normally on Zoom, but here we are on, on, on a webinar. Um, and this is for the collaboration that we've got with Joburg Ballet. It's actually the second time we've done a collaboration with Joburg Ballet. We did it a couple of years ago. And the process is quite an interesting one. We send Joburg Ballet um, a, a, a range of artworks from, our, from our, this North-South live auction. And then they select some works that appeal to them and show them to the choreographers. And Wilhelm later on is going to take you through that whole process with the um, with the choreographers and we will hear what inspired them and how they interpreted the artworks. I'm actually sitting in the viewing room with Arisha. We're in the Joburg office. Um, the auction which, which we're, we're showcasing here is our flagship live auction, which takes place, it's a bit of a marathon. It's from Sunday the 8th until Wednesday the 11th of November. We have over 900 lots available, 928 to be absolutely specific. Um, we are open for viewing in the Johannesburg office and the Cape Town office. So in Joburg, we are in Houghton, we're at 89 Central Street. Um, you are very welcome to come and view and see the works that we have on offer. In Cape Town, they're in a different venue. It's called Brickfields in Woodstock. It's 35 Brickfield Road. We are just asking that our clients and friends, if you wouldn't mind making an appointment, we want to stick to these uh, COVID regulations. We don't want a second wave. So um, we are asking for masks, and but, but we would love people to visit us. So please, you just hop on our website, www.strassart. Uh, .co.za and you can make a time to come and view. 
But moving on to what we're actually all here for, which is the launch of this collaboration of the ballet, um, I'd like to welcome our first guest, who is Ian MacDonald. Ian is the artistic director for the Joburg Ballet. Hello, Ian. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're delighted. And Ian, what absolutely gripped me about this collaboration was the title that you came up with, which is Stillness in Motion, Art Meets Dance. I wish I could say that Strauss and Company had come up with it, but we didn't. It was Joe Booth Ballet. How did you arrive at this lovely title? Jackie, I, like you, would also like to take credit for the title name. But in all fairness, it actually wasn't my input whatsoever. Um, I, love, I love the title. But our, our marketing and, and publications administrator for Joe Booth Ballet, Jonathan Herbert, he actually came up with the title. Um, and I think it is just such an apt name. Uh, for what we're all going to be doing tonight. So kudos to him. Um, I, I actually chatted to him, funny enough, just briefly and said to him, you know, Jonathan, how do you come up with these names? Because he's so creative. And, you know, I think being in the, the environment for so long, as Jonathan has, he um, just gets key words. And, um, and then whatever rings to him, he sort of puts forward. And I think this name, as we've just said now, is really, really apt. And it's um, a beautiful name. I think we should use it for one of our productions going forward, in fact. Well, definitely. We, we hope we can have an audience by then and come and view it. I mean, this has been an incredibly difficult time for the arts in, um, and particularly for performers. I mean, artists as well, but for performers. And I just wondered, as artistic director, how have you managed to inspire the and keep the dancers motivated? It's a good question, Jackie. I think while we were in lockdown, that was really, really trying for everyone. You know, your small apartment to, to keep you in classes and you know, trying to get them going on that level was um, was different. And I think it's really opened our eyes um, to realize just how fortunate we are to be in the space that we are here at the Joburg Theatre with our beautiful studios that, um, you know, Keke and I are actually sitting in the studios right now. Um, beautiful open space. And to not have access to that in lockdown um, was, was very difficult. But um, we are blessed to say that we are back in our studios at the Joburg Theatre and just seeing the environment behind us um, is motivation enough for the dancers of Joba Ballet to, to get going again. And um, I'm so proud of them because they really have, with masks and all, we are doing classes and rehearsals and um, they really are doing a, an amazing job. So we're blessed to have the incredible artists of Joba Ballet who are wanting to get back out there and do what they do best. Absolutely. And that brings me to you, Keke. I mean, Keke is a dynamo and in charge of the communications for Joba Ballet. And Keke, I mean, not having an audience for dancers must be the most frustrating thing, not to mention the financial aspect of that. I mean, how is Joburg Ballet managing without having an audience buying tickets and coming to see your productions? Yeah, Jackie, I think you really touched on the, you know, the, the, the most, one of the most important parts of this whole thing, it being the financial impact. And I think that, you know, um, if people remember, the last time that Joburg Ballet was actually on stage, it's literally the weekend when President Ramaphosa announced the first official lockdown. So we found our artists and the orchestra on stage at the Joburg Theatre during the production of Don Quixote. And then suddenly 6 p.m. came when our performance on the Sunday ended. And then the world was a different place, especially in Africa at that moment. So we've had to find some innovative ways of, you know, um, reaching out to our audiences as well as trying to find what the kind of way that they would actually consume our kind of art form. Because as you mentioned, they want to see it live, they want to come to the theatre, they want to experience, you know, be, be immersed in the experience. And so a lot of people then resorted to um, versions of the performances that they would be able to create on virtual spaces such as the Zoom platform, on our YouTube channels, Facebook and other social media. And that was a very big challenge for us because not all of us were prepared to actually share our art on virtual spaces. So suddenly we found ourselves looking into, you know, finding what it means to stream and how do you stream a live performance or how do you stream a pre-recorded performance and the costs that are associated with that, you know. A lot of us have been so shocked to find out what it just costs because even somebody today, because it's World Ballet Day, by the way, and somebody said, oh, I thought that you just put your video online with your camera and then just there you go. But they're not thinking about the rights for the music, the artists that are involved, all the equipment that a videographer needs and all of that. So, I mean, we've then created our merchandise page on joeagballet.com forward slash merchandise. 
and people can either donate or purchase some of the items that we've created, which include our very, very fabulous masks. And I'm trying to get hold of mine now. Oh, it's right here. Where they are all, <laughs> all very COVID regulatory masks that we have been selling and people have been loving them. And our dancers perform in them. So they are good enough for dancers and good enough for our patrons. And we've just been so grateful for all of our supporters who really pitched their donations as well as their time in this very, very um, dire time and in time of need. Fantastic. Thank you so much, KK. And I think that there are details on, on our website and, of course, on the Joburg Ballet website. So if you do enjoy the performance and you would like to make a contribution, of course, it would always be welcome. And now we're going to, to hand over to Wilhelm van Rensburg. Uh, Wilhelm, over to you to discuss these lovely dancers and the art and the inspiration thereof. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Um, as you mentioned before, we presented Joburg Ballet with uh, a, a selection of what we thought are very good artworks, and uh, we offered them uh, 30 works, of which they chose these two wonderful works, the Gerard Sokoto from the Marketplace Dakar on the left-hand side, and the Mongese Mkapai, the abstract composition on the right-hand side. And so uh, I want to start, I want to start with the, the Gerard Sokoto, and I'm going to, um, uh, and I also uh, like uh, <clears throat> this uh, presentation, uh, this uh, uh, a slide where it says the inspiration at the top and the interpretation. And that brings me to, to Melo uh, Le Kana. He uh, is one of the directors. And uh, my question to you, to Melo, is uh, what was the thinking going into selecting this work? And also, how did you go about then uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, the development of the dance that eventually we're going to see later tonight? Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a great honor to be part of this uh, project. Um, well, obviously we were, um, I chose this, uh, the painting because I, th I thought the painting spoke to me, you know, when I saw the painting, obviously, I just thought, okay, this I can work with. And then it's because of probably the colors as well. The colors are quite bright and uh, they give me a sense of Africa at the same time. So that's what I saw as well when I saw the painting. And as well, like the, the, the people are painted in like black. So with that, I then started creating um, stories for the people because for me, that is like... Uh, you know, um, what can I say? Um, it's not, uh, it's, 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 ooh, how can I put it on? It's like, it's just people painted, but they're not in color. So it's a mis yes, it's a mystery. So with me, with that being said, then I started creating um, stories for, for the, for the, for the people. So then I came up with stories like, um, I told them they must imagine themselves being in a, like we are obviously in a in a in a in a like we were obviously from lockdown and all those other things so i just said to them as humans i felt like we are uh as humans we are we have we are very good natured and all of those things so i just wanted to show that as well in the piece so i told them that uh anna which is the other lady she to me, I created a story for her that she is like a abused, uh, like an abused woman or whatever. She has problems at home. And then there's Revel, who's the man, for, who is the guy. So he's like the support. And then there's Shannon. Shannon is also the support. So she's like, they are advising and on how to do things. So you'll see in the movement as well, they do like certain, like they do the same movements but in different ways. So it's like them having a conversation saying, okay, as a lady, this is how we do this. So as a, as a man, as a man from my side, this is how I would advise you to do this. So it's just like a story, it's a journey as well. So I just wanted to create the journey for the people, like just like a journey to when the, um, when the, when the painting or the picture was taken. So it's actually, if you look at the piece, it's actually in reverse. So I just wanted to create that story, like before we got, um, before we got to the picture. So that's my whole idea in the piece. So I just wanted to show how 
humans are and as Africans, we are very good natured people. And obviously it's an African uh, artist that we, we are, um, uh, it's an African artist that we are portraying as well. So, and I'm also an African artist myself. So I just wanted to really, really just bring that Africanness into the piece as well. So yeah, I hope that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely, Tomato. And uh, it's very interesting your listening to your whole description because we as art historians look at it completely differently. And uh, the yes. work that you have chosen uh, comes from the period when Sokoto uh, lived in Paris. He, of course, left South Africa in 1947, settled in Paris, and he mm -hmm. lived there his whole life. But in 1966, he actually went to a big conference of uh, uh, Black artists in Dakar in Senegal. And this inspired him not only to paint uh, the, the, the watercolor that you chose for, for your choreography, but works such as these. And what struck me are these very beautiful elongated figures uh, with a very beautiful, elegant um, uh, and colorful dresses, like you can mm. see in, uh, in, uh, in these works. You have to yes. remember that 1966 was the first time that he set soil on, uh, 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 on African, uh, uh, set foot on uh, African soil after he left South Africa in 1947. Um, mm. He, of course, was a very outgoing person. Uh, he befriended the Black Consciousness uh, 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 people across the road from where he lived in Paris uh, and he also um, uh, made friends with uh, other expatriates such as uh, with Fredo Lum from Cuba and Skanda Bogosian from uh, Ethiopia and from time to time also Ernest Mangoba, uh, a fellow South African uh, expat. Uh, but uh, also from Senegal, the, the movement uh, in these two uh, examples, uh, I think, uh, are also uh, quite uh, quite fascinating. Um, I'm showing you these two posters because uh, in 1959, Sakota was asked to design this poster for the Negro Writers and Artists Conference in uh, in Rome, um, and uh, he also read a paper at this particular uh, conference. And on the right hand side, I'm showing you the po poster of the 1966. Uh, Black Artist Festival in uh, Dakar. He didn't design this one, uh, but he certainly was a big presence there. And again, he read a paper at that uh, particular particular conference. Um, and uh, just to go on to look at some of the stills that uh, of, of uh, the ballet you uh, the piece you uh, you uh, uh, designed, uh, the, the 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 dancers uh, moved through the space. And uh, this one uh, was particularly striking because I think the male dancer here, in a sense, echoes the stance of this beautiful sculpture by Isram Lahai here called The Prisoner, which I find quite fascinating. And at the back, an equally intriguing work by Alexis Preller called Craters. Um, this comes from a, a period in his uh, career where he experimented with what is known as uh, the intaglio work. Now, when you look at the image on the left, it almost seems as uh, it bulges out. Uh, it is convex, but when you work, uh, look up closely, it's actually concave. So this work plays uh, tricks with, uh, with your perceptions. Uh, the, the crater refers to his experiences uh, in the Second World War. He was a medic during that time, North Africa, Italy. Uh, and I think you get sort of a, a, the sense of a ravaged landscape after the, 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 the Second World War. Um, uh, another, an, a, another still from, uh, from that dance, um, and uh, you can see the wonderful movements of uh, the artists, uh, the dancers in front of uh, that uh, work. And I am now going to ask Arisha, uh, the, the, the hostess here, to talk a little bit about this work. Uh, sure. Um, so as you can see, the work is actually behind me right now. And it's, it's a beautiful work. It's quite large. Uh, Wilhelm, do you mind going back uh, one slide? Uh, yeah, so it's, you can just see, I mean, you can see the scale of it and uh, when they were dancing through the space and they came to this work, it just so, the, the, the dancers, especially their, 
um, their costumes just match the work so well. The yellow just really picks up all the yellows in the work. Um, also that wonderful blue that they have um, also just complements the work so well. And I think it just, it just one of those uh, happy coincidences um, that they dance in front of this work. Um, and this work is by an artist called Norman Catherine. Uh, it's titled Who Zoo? And it basically is a sculpture which has um, about 37 small, uh, smaller wooden figurines um, and each in these sort of blocks, as you can see behind me. Um, I'm gonna do more of a, a detailed talk on Norman Catherine tomorrow, but just to give you sort of an overview of this work, um, you know, Norman Catherine, uh, his work is always very satirical and, and uh, in a way witty. Um, and these figurines he first developed um, in about 1973, 1974. Um, and they were sort of this expression or what can be known as pop expressionism um, on um, sort of a series of um, dealing with sort of a surreal, um, surreal or uh, psychological anxieties that one would feel, especially living in the material world, which, is, which you can see as uh, all the figures are wearing sort of occupational attire. Um, and if you look more at some of his other figurines, you'll see he always dresses up his character, characters as businessmen or policemen. Um, and each one is sort of like a, a comment on, on society. Um, this is a wonderful um, co collection of these figurines that are all put together in this sort of boxed frame. Um, and this can be uh, compared to another work that was similar that sold in 2016 owned by uh, David Bowie. So the musician David Bowie um, came to South Africa and you know really um, admired Norman Catherine's works and he, he purchased a number of these figurines um, which then went on to auction in 2016. I think it fetched somewhere around 1.6 million rand. Um, but obviously, I mean, just to more speak about the work and, and sort of its beauty. Um, and, you know, in, in this work, you get these figures that are sort of um, abstracted and it's sort of like half figure, half animal. And I think seeing the dancers in front of this work is, is such a, a wonderful combination um, and pairing because often in ballet, you see these, you know, these dancers and they are, are, it's phenomenal what they can do with their bodies and how they move their bodies. And, it almost seems in a way animal-like and just, you know, you, you can't imagine ever, I mean, if I try and bend down to pick up something, my back feels sore. So you can't imagine how they just move their bodies in such grace. Um, and so I, ju I just think that when they were dancing in front of this work, it just made such an amazing pairing. Um, yeah, so. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Arisha. Uh, that brings us to uh, the second choice by Mongesi Ngapai here. And I'm going to ask uh, the choreographer, uh, Mario Gaglioni, to talk, us, uh, to talk to us a little bit about this one. Uh, why did you choose this one? And how, in what way did this inspire you for the piece that you choreographed? Good evening, everyone. And thank you for having me here and for having this amazing opportunity to share and talk about these amazing artworks. Um, first of all, um, the choice of an abstract piece instead of a, a figurative piece or something that describes something more easily comes across as a bold choice sometimes because it gives you much more freedom in terms of what you can do and how you can express yourself. There's so much texture to this piece, to this piece of art. There's so much uh, range of different shades of the yellow and the dots of the red, uh, the black dots and the one red line that just, there was something about it that intrigued me. And it was saying, this is the one, you can work with this because you never know how far you can go and what you can use from it. So I decided to go with that choice and also explore the theme of the virus and what it's doing to us right now because we are all are being affected by it. So there's no denying in it. And I, I basically wanted to use uncomfortable things that can be part of the human nature. Because in my opinion, when I see uh, this specific abstract piece, there's some parts of it that make me uncomfortable, but that's because it's an emotional response that I, that I see. And then the more I look at it in detail, 
then I find other things, like I find the folds of the yellow in, in the background quite pleasing, which is weird. And also the, the single white uh, part that looks to me like a shark tooth. And there's just so many references that to me are quite random, but they work in a way that inspire me to imagine things and create them. So with that and with the idea of the virus, I just work with an amazing dancer whose name is Mahlati Sashani. And poor guy, yes, I rehearsed him to death <laughs> with this solo. So yes, it's a single dancer. Uh, it's a solo choreography. And even the choice of the music and the background, I didn't use a piece of music, a set piece of music. I decided to kind of create with my very basic skill, skills in music creations, if you can call it so, uh, just something that includes sounds and vibrations and heartbeats and voices and just soft tones of background noises just to leave also a sort of freedom to whoever's watching to take what they want from it and make their own understanding of it. Even though in my, the way I created it, it kind of flows in a way that the breath in the background symbolizes the <clears throat> difficulty of breathing with the, with the virus. And then the heartbeat section, because this heartbeat section symbolizes to me this, the, the um, difficulty that right now, let's say hospitals are facing with the amount of people that are having to be recovered and hospitalized. And then the noises of the numerous people discussing the, in, in the t I call it a TV section. There's a, there's a section in, in the piece where uh, there's a lot of noises taken from different countries, uh, TV report, news reports. And I just went country by country and I took uh, this the exact moment where they were describing what the COVID was doing in their country. And this was back in uh, April, May, when I was researching and thinking about what to do choreographically with uh, my ideas on the virus. And then this, uh, this piece of art came and I thought that's it's a perfect pairing. But anyway, yes, I also believe that being inspired by all the other paintings in the gallery was just such an addition to the whole experience because as artists, I believe that you never, you never stop taking inspiration from different sources, right? And just being able to see that the variety of paintings and statues and all the art that was in, in the gallery before we even filmed, just shocked me and made me think, wow, I'm, I wonder what uh, the artists behind these paintings were inspired by. And consequently, I was inspired by one of them. So I believe that it's like a constant cycle that it, it's just a beautiful thing about art. I just, I think it's amazing. But yes, I have to say thank you so much to whoever made this possible, all of you, and especially to my dancer, which poor guy, <laughs> I made him dance this solo for, for so many hours of rehearsals and I think he did amazing. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're gonna enjoy it. I hope you do. So thank you everyone. Yeah, and uh, what is interesting uh, to me is you, you spoke about uh, the background sound and all the differences in sound qualities and uh, volumes. Uh, and then just looking at uh, the background art, uh, look how beautiful your choice here goes with that wonderful landscape by Andrew Fustad there. And the posture here of the dancer echoed in this uh, collage work by Kea Sun. I think uh, it is uh, it is quite uh, quite phenomenal. And, uh, you know, the intellectual work that you mentioned that goes into making art, I think is, uh, is, uh, is quite uh, phenomenal. Uh, but I want to now call on Richard Ndemande, one of our specialists here at Strauss & Company, uh, to give his uh, uh, view from an art historical perspective on this work by Mongezi Ngapai. Yeah, uh, thanks, Wilhelm. And uh, it's interesting that you you saw something completely different uh, from this work. And 
I'd like to also mention that Mongezi, when he works, he draws from different sources of uh, uh, inspiration and such as uh, uh, jazz music. And uh, 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 he also comments on uh, migration of people uh, going into the city to work. And in, in this work, we can see like uh, bits, uh, dots, which can be uh, uh, musical uh, scores or people um, migrating from uh, uh, rural areas into the city to, to, to work and uh, uh, coming uh, from these, uh, 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 this open land and flooding the city. And also uh, the, the, when he works, he also collects maps and he also draws inspiration from that. So it could be a, a, a map as well. But uh, I, I like uh, uh, your interpretation, uh, uh, which is totally different uh, because uh, Mongezi also, when he works, uh, sometimes he gives uh, meaning to his work later after it's complete. And I hope that uh, he, when he hears uh, your your interpretation of the the virus, he 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 appreciates that and adds it to to the work. So. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, Mario, um, I, I really like the idea that uh, the, the dancer occupied the whole space and moving into different sections of the exhibition, uh, 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 exhibition that, uh, that, uh, that Strauss has, uh, has put up here. And uh, here, simply because in the background, you see a phenomenally large scale work by the artist Judith Mason. Uh, did that come into play when you uh, choreographed this piece, uh, the, the, the piece or was it just serendipitous uh, or anything you want to say about that? Funny thing, sorry, funny thing about that specific art piece is that as soon as I entered the gallery and I was exploring the space to, you know, tell my dancer, okay, in this section, take more space on this side or that side, that specific painting by Mason was just, just took me and drew me, drew me to it. And I was fascinated by the womb and the tea bag and the, the skull face, like one of the faces up there. So yes, I, I was struck by it. And I did tell my dancer in the start of the, of the solo to start right in front of it. And I don't know, maybe it's just uh, so an unconscious decision that I made, or I don't know what it was, but yes, it did inspire me with regards to the spacing and the filming of it, because I just thought it was incredible. Yeah, yeah I think uh, we, we can't wait to see the, the final uh, piece. Uh, but just to tell you a little bit about the, this work, it's a type of self-portrait, if you like, and uh, she, she, however, titles it Women Artists Need uh, Wives. And uh, she's commenting on the sort of uh, traditional division of labor, especially in the house, uh, in the house where uh, the, the woman has to cook and clean, raise children, look after the pets and what have you. And so little uh, time is left uh, to devote to uh, developing as a professional artist. And uh, she really would like to, uh, uh, to have some assistance, uh, somebody who, who would understand uh, her particular needs. Now, the, uh, the, the, the work is interesting for me because you can see uh, the, 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 the uh, dungarees here that she often wore when she, uh, she painted. And uh, the, uh, the face is made up of multiple images, some in profile, some full frontal. So uh, indicating to me that uh, her personality is not fixed, it's not immutable, uh, it, it, it varies, you know. So, uh, and you can see that uh, in, uh, in, in the profiles and in uh, the faces here, but also interesting, uh, the hands and it, uh, it's almost as if they are moving, almost as if it is a Shiva type of uh, figure uh, in front of you, some goddess. Uh, conjuring up these wonderful images uh, out of uh, uh, nothing. And uh, Mario, you rightly referred to the tea bag, you know, the different uh, things that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that a woman has to, 
uh, it has to do in a conventional um, uh, uh, household. Now, um, it's interesting because for me, it's almost uh, as if this is an inventory of some of the recurring images and symbols in our art. When you look closely at this hand, for instance, this arm, the forearm here, you can see there's sort of a snake curling around it, but the mouth of the snake then morphs into this wonderful flower over here. So the snake is a, a, a recurring thing, a, a, a symbol. Um, and uh, the whole idea of uh, a woman, wife, mother, and what have you, compartmentalizing uh, the, uh, the, the different aspects of one's life, you can see in these little compartments of the images on the, on the, on the right-hand side. And interestingly enough, also the peacock, another recurring uh, animal in, uh, uh, in her work. The monkey, she had pet monkeys, uh, very naughty, she always said, because they're so destructive and they're so nonchalant and couldn't care less of what you make out of them. Uh, and uh, little fragments here, some bits of writing where she says, uh, I'm offering you my ruins, so to speak, for you to, uh, to do whatever uh, you, uh, uh, you like. So a uh, completely fascinating work telling us about, uh, you know, the role of women in society and uh, the act of uh, creation and uh, how people go about their creative lives. So, so quite a phenomenal work, I think. Then you got the dancer to, to move away from uh, Mario, uh, to move away from that and move through a series of sculptures, like in this one. Uh, what was the progression that you intended here with this dance? <clears throat> yes, so I, I like to always keep things dynamic. I don't really like to get stuck in a one sort of setting when it comes to a choreography. So I saw this beautiful corridor and I knew that in, in this piece that I designed, there's a section where he's advancing forward. And I thought, why not incorporate more art pieces and place them in a way that also triggers something in the dancer as he's dancing, because he has to advance through them and come all the way forward towards the camera. And I, I saw them at the entrance of, of, the, of this side of the gallery, and I just thought, thought it would be a good idea to incorporate them and use them as, as a part, a living part of the, of, of the choreography, because Yes, we are. We can see all the paintings on the walls, but the floor is it's pretty free and it's owned by the dancer alone. So I thought at this point in the piece, I need and I want an addition to make it stronger, especially because in terms of visual, he's all the way down on the floor. So you get the perspective that shifts from a normal height to down, all the way down. And... I thought I could play with that and use him as part as, as, as if he was one of them at one point. And but but as they're staying still because they're statues, he's moving amongst them, and hence also goes the, the title that I had chosen for, for, for this piece, which is the silent wanderer. Because you you have on one side the part silent that obviously there's no sound to it. He's, he's very quiet and wanderer because he moves even though he's uh, undetected, like the virus, hence the, the reason why. So I thought that would be a really good idea to incorporate other um, entities inside of it, which would make the, 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 um, the point of it stronger in a way. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely fascinating what you're saying. You know, those uh, relationships that you are exploring between different artworks and different uh, sort of uh, stationary and live, uh, I, I find that fascinating. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting back to uh, Richard and the Monday here. And uh, Richard, I wonder if you can tell us uh, about some of uh, the sculptures through which the, uh, the dancer moved. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, so with these, um, I must say, uh, these are three of uh, my favorite uh, uh, sculptures in, in our sale. And they are done by our, our most prominent, one of our most prominent uh, South African mid-century sculptor, Ezra Mulakai. And 
uh, the two goats are, are, are the one uh, is is uh, uh, African goat and the other one is she goat and the the figure standing here is the prisoner or by Ezra Mlachai and Ezra Mlachai like the the, the ballet dancers uh, has a way of taking something like a a a, 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 a painful and, and powerful and turn it into something completely beautiful and he was uh, influenced uh, uh, by uh, 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 African uh, ways of, of traditions of, of making sculptures, uh, uh, both, and he, co he combined them with uh, 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 Western and, and European ways of uh, uh, expressionism. And we can see the Africanness in the, the face of the African goat. Uh, it's, it's like an African mask-like, and the, the bodies of the goats are a uh, 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 European and uh, modern expressionist uh, 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 stylistic uh, 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 approach in them. And the, the figure here uh, has influences of the, the if you are familiar with them, the Cubism uh, uh, a style, which was a, a, an avant-garde uh, art movement uh, in the 20th uh, century. And yeah, these are my, are my favorite uh, works. And it's interesting that uh, with the dance they are dealing with, uh, they, they're commenting on the pandemic and Ezra Mlachai would have uh, done these work uh, during another struggle, which is apartheid. And now we're facing a different struggle, uh, which is a pandemic, uh, 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 coronavirus. But uh, these links are, uh, 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 are interesting to me that uh, there's a, a sense of struggle and agony uh, in, in different ways and different times. And, uh, and it's interesting, you know, that you mentioned the, the prisoner here, because in a sense, going back to Mario's uh, theme that he's pursuing about uh, the, the, the virus, you know, so uh, in a way we are imprisoned and uh, yes. in my mind, certainly the dancer liberates himself. So, uh, I, so I find I the, to... the symbolism here quite, uh, uh, quite striking. Can I just interrupt you, Wilhelm? We, we, we're moving on to the time for our premiere launch of the ballet. Um, and Arisha, I'm going to hand over to her because she, she is a lot more tech savvy and she's going to explain how we get to see the video of the dancers performing these two wonderful pieces. Thank you to everybody who has participated. Over to you, Arisha. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to the Joburg Ballet, to the dancers, to the choreographers. Um, it has been a very wonderful uh, collaboration and I'm, uh, we've really, really enjoyed it. Um, so now for everybody to, uh, I've posted a link in the chat. Uh, if you just click on that YouTube link, the, the premiere is um, scheduled to start at quarter to seven on the dot. So we'll all be able to watch it together in live, in live time, and there will be a live chat function as well for the video. So um, yeah, I hope everybody enjoys. Once again, thanks to everyone. Thank you for um, attending. Um, I hope you have enjoyed it and I hope you will really enjoy the, the ballet and the dances. Um, I'll just leave this, this Zoom open. So if anybody does have trouble, you can, you can get back onto the link. Um, but if you, if you can just see that the link is there in the chat function. If anybody has any trouble, just feel free to pop a message in here and I will attend to you straight away.